how are you going? I'm good, really good. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, look, and thank you for joining us today uh, for our Early Learning Leaders podcast. Um, what we've been asking our guests is about their early le- early learning education and care journey, about how you, can you share with us how you um, started that journey? Thank you. Thanks for having me, Paula. I Pleasure. think um, it was kind of a bit of a funny situation because I didn't start in early years at all, and like actually like a lot of us, to be honest. I started, I've heard some of your podcasts and some of the other speakers. I'm probably in the same position that we didn't sort of just start in early years to begin with. But I did do a primary teaching diploma many years ago, so I was always interested in education and children. That was a little bit of my passion. And then when I uh, finished that course, there wasn't a lot of jobs and I wasn't um, confident enough to go and work in a regional or rural area. So being young, I ended up getting a job in um, finance and banking and had quite a a long career and a great career in that uh, field in banking. Um, And I did sort of specialise in in people. I loved the people side of it, so the HR side of it and the performance management side of it and things like that. So I really, really liked that. Then what happened was I had some um, I had some children, so I took some time off and had lovely lovely family and decided how can I balance um, the corporate side was very very difficult, very long hours, and both my partner and I in corporate, which is where we met. So well, then I decided to do some community work. They started um, kindergarten, local kindergarten. I joined the committee, started learning all about community. And then there was a, um, a position that was vacant for a uh, teacher at the service. And because I'd had some recruitment experience, I, I asked the then president, ha, ha, who's doing the recruitment? And they said, oh. oh, he said, I am. And I said, oh, great. What firm do you work for? And uh, this is me, my corporate hat on. And uh, what recruitment? He says, oh, I'm, I'm a bus driver. <laughs> I started thinking, now, what's going on here? And then I started to realise that community was really, really different to banking and corporate, which I had been so focused on. And that opened a whole new world. Of course, I had a few skills that I was able to support them with the recruitment, then got involved, then um, got quite involved, became president of the kindergarten, then went along to an AGM for here in Victoria. We had a peak organisation for uh, kindergartens called Kindergartens Parents Victoria, which is now... Ella, Early Learning Association Australia. So went along as the representative from our service and um, they were talking about performance um, management, I suppose, which is not a great term that I like to use, but performance management of teachers and um, doing new new things. The Kirby report was out. That was fresh. And I was then approached by the then uh, CEO Jared Mansour of the of KPV and said, "Would I like to?" Because jo- I asked a few questions during the AGM, so he said, "Would I like to join the LAR reference group?" And I thought, "Oh, sure." So wow, I did that, and that was great. Ended up chairing that for six years, so a couple of years as sitting on the committee, then chaired it. So I got quite heavily involved in the IR side and the HR side, and started to realise that we didn't really have a good process for. Um, performance evaluation and development of our staff in early years. So I'm probably talking more specifically now around Victoria. And that led me to then be on the, I was then invited to go on the board for KPV, which then turned into Ella. And then after all of that stint, my children were back at school and I'd had all these new skills and people were saying, oh, you should do consulting, stay in the early years sector. Uh, There's not a lot of not a lot of people with the sort of skills in the HR, governance, business side, um, more in the teaching, education, curriculum yeah. side. So um, I did some work for local council and some other committees and things I were on, and they were really encouraging. So I thought that might be a good, good sort of balance for me to do consulting with raising a family. So that's kind of how I got into it. So I'm a little bit different to other consultants is that I don't get involved in um sort of supporting or mentoring educational leaders or anything like that. It's more the management governance side uh, of things. And my passion is the, is the people. Yes. Wow. And this, and, and, um, and your background certainly gives, gives that level of um, expertise to services that are, that are trying to do better, that are trying to do more, but also work out what they need to do. 
Yeah, sometimes. And sometimes they're just unclear of, they get caught up in the day-to-day, the busyness yeah. of just getting, you know, the, the quick done and who's on, are the ratios correct and all those sorts of things. And they sort of, they don't forget because that's not the right thing to, that's not the right word, but they probably don't allow as much time as what they could on working on the culture and the performance development of their staff and their leaders and ensuring that there are good practices in place for putting the development plans in and also just monitoring, helping, coaching, offering professional learning. So that's where we come in. And also just the having the right governance structure in place. Do you have the right yes. rules and competencies to get done what you want to do? So a lot of your listeners will be approved providers of centres that probably do strategic planning. We help how do you translate your planning and your strategic plan. Sometimes we also help to develop strategic planning with services. Um, but then how do you translate that down to make that um, practical in, in what, what you want to achieve with your staff? Yeah, and also being mindful of how you implement that given that educators are busy with children and it's actually that, that buy-in from that side from educators who are thinking another thing we've got to do rather than realising it's actually something they're doing probably anyway. It just puts it in practice. And that's one of the things we hear a lot when we work with um, clients. We, we try and take a consultative approach where we involve the leadership um, all the we give everyone actually I try and every, everyone's a leader in their own way in a service so try and get as much consultation with everyone as possible whether yeah. it's through surveys um, sometimes we do forums sometimes we do workshops we try and get everyone involved and, and we do hear that oh Kathy you don't understand we're so busy day to day on the floor or you know we we're doing things with parents and families but then on the flip side when we do interviews and and and, and surveys, what our research tells us is that it is really important and they do want that. They do want to have that um, professional learning. They do want to have the feedback. They do want to be acknowledged. So we have to find a way, and that's what we try and do with our clients, navigate a way where um, you might not be able, to, be able to do everything we suggest is best practice, but just starting small steps. That's right. Yeah, absolutely, which actually leads on to my next question for today is um, the topic that we're covering is performance management. So when we prepared the episode, we talked about performance management. How would you frame that within the context of an early learning service? And, and I know you're sort of giving us some bits and pieces, so um, we'll, we'll continue on that track. So in an early learning service, it there's, there's, I've seen inconsistency in how that's done at the moment. So that's probably yes. the word I would use, inconsistent. Time is a factor. Um, sometimes um, confidence. So it might just be that people uh, do what they like doing, what they're comfortable doing. So sometimes a bit uncomfortable to do performance development planning and evaluation. So I've gone away, actually, I will mention, I've gone away from the word, and this is my colleagues and I years ago, we've tried to come away from the word performance management because it has, we did some research again in the early years sector in here in Victoria, and we found it was a bit negative, the, the connotation. So in a corporate sector, it's quite different. It's still used a lot, performance management. Yes. However, in the early years culture, it felt like we have to be performance managed, like something's wrong. So we've changed the word and trying to talk about performance evaluation rather than performance management. So we talk about de performance development. So if we look at National Quality Standard 7.2.3, it is a requirement to have some sort of performance development plan uh, or professional development plan or performance plan for all of your employees and also to evaluate their performance regularly. Now, how... What that looks like, I've seen everything from the minimum. So actually nothing. I've seen nothing. Nothing happens at all. So people say we haven't had anything like that for years. To I've seen um, uh, the teachers or the staff set a couple of goals for themselves at the start of the year and yep. then they assess themselves at the end of the year. Okay. And, yes. and, and, and very simple. Yes, that's not best practice, but that's very, very simple. Uh, so what we try and uh, talk to our clients about is what is a successful 
why what is the benefits of it and what, what's successful and it's all about the relationship and the people so whoever you're uh, working with reporting to whoever's leading that process for you if the more you meet with that person the more trust the more the relationship builds the more you can give feedback and receive feedback because it is it is both ways for the employer and employee it just creates a better environment for everyone. If you're only seeing someone once or twice a year and having these conversations, it can be really difficult. But if you're doing it more regularly, it's easier. Yes. And and look, touching on, you mentioned the um, National Quality Framework um, and obviously that impacts on their rating. Yes, it does. So and that's a big deal. Does. It is a big deal and it is one of the areas which i found that um, it's not it's not unpacked very, uh, you can sort of do a simple approach and still get a tick. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. But really, it's not about the tick for me and for my clients. It's about how are we going to do this that's going to be best for our staff, which leads to better outcomes for our children and our families and our reputation. So the staff are happy, the staff feel recognised, appreciated, heard, they're getting professional learning. They want to be part of your organisation. Your brand, your reputation improves. That gets well known in the community. You get enrolment. So it kind of goes in a big cycle. So it it really is, it's, it's more than just the, the getting the, the sort of the tick, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. And often the, the ones that have just got the tick, the, that's where that impact can be felt maybe through their staffing, through their children and that higher staff turnover even could be a could be a um, a fall out of that absolutely and again in our research where we've, we've done a lot of surveys a lot of people will leave because of the people they're working with so it's the or they just felt that they're not being recognized and not being acknowledged and unfortunately and I say unfortunately in early years we've still got a long way to go where people are able to be a bit more transparent in their feelings they yes. are with the children and the families but when it comes to their colleagues oh everyone's you know privately anonymously in surveys or when they talk to me I get a different story but when I first go in I get told everybody gets along everybody's happy um you know everything's great we we don't let the families know that anything's going on and the children are still getting a quality program and that might all be true but when you unpack it a bit Further, we find that there are some issues between staff and between rooms, for example. So you might have a philosophy, but then somebody's doing their own thing over here and somebody's got a different interpretation over there. Nobody really wants to talk about it. Um, and that causes friction and tension underlying. Because almost rather than being about the service and the children, it almost becomes a competition. In the a competition sense. and we're trying and I know there's a lot of good work happening now and there's a lot of more people doing things uh, more collaboratively which is fantastic but sometimes there's also difficult conversations we have to have and there is some feedback that we have to give <laughs> and that's where that performance evaluation comes into it so we we I guess what we try and say is set something up for the year for the performance period of a year so most organizations find that a calendar year works well, so January to December. Have everyone uh, understanding at the start of that process that they've got some goals or some key performance indicators. We're hoping that they'll be linked with uh, areas that they need to strengthen within themselves, but also some of the things that maybe the strategic plan is, um, is yes. requiring that service to achieve. Yes. And then once you've got that, then the minimum, and I mean the absolute minimum I would recommend, is then having a mid-year uh, evaluation point where you set up a time to assess how that's going and ensuring that any resources or mentoring or professional development that was talked about has been explored or undertaken. If not, why not? And we, do we need to adjust things? And would be remiss of me not to say it's also a time to say, you know, is it still achievable? Because... A couple of years ago, we had, you know, all sorts of things going on in the world where some of the things that we might have planned for just weren't achievable because the priorities. That's right, stopped. yeah, yeah. Uh, or, or in another scenario, years ago, we had bushfires, we had services burnt down. So there was, you know, 
we, we've got to acknowledge, actually, when we did our research to look at what was best practice, a lot of the teaching staff wanted the opportunity to document where they'd had challenges through the year. Right. And weren't able to maybe um, fulfil what they intended or was required of them or expected or they wanted to do. Yeah. So, and speaking yeah. of that, like, so that would obviously be a putting a structure or something that we we're talking about in mm-hmm. place, like surveys to help services get on the right path. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more um, about systems and structures? Uh, and I know you mentioned the half yearly and the mid year review, um, and then and then what other things would would yeah. So obviously offer? the annual everybody's very familiar with the annual review, so that would be a culmination of everything. Some of the tips I'd say is work with your leadership team and your staff to find out what capacity and what will work in your service. So the best practice would be uh, for early years is what I have found is that the we introduce something called a waterfall approach so yes. that your uh, director, centre manager, nominated supervisor, whoever's doing the day-to-day management of the service, they would lead the performance development plan and evaluation process, whatever you decide that to be, for the, the staff that report to them. And it might be the educational leader, it might be the room leaders or the ECTs, edu- early childhood teachers. And then the early childhood teachers or the room leaders would then lead that process for their educators in their room. So yes. you have the centre manager trying to meet with everybody you break it down so that no one's got more than, you know, four or five people that they're responsible for to lead it. And when I say lead it, it is a collaborative approach, but there is a leader to lead the process. The other things I'd say is ensuring that it's consistent. So I've had some situations where people will say, oh, look, we're not, we're only doing it for the people that are underperforming. And I have to say, no, no, that's a completely different process this is positive this is development and this is for everyone your chef your cleaner your maintenance guy your receptionist any anybody admin teachers educators so whoever you've got working at your service participates in the process uh, and then, so so the minimum would be the three meetings in the year. But in addition to that, what we found that works quite well in early years is also having a monthly check-in, 15 yes. minutes. So we have a little bit of a, we give you some tips on what you could talk about in those meetings. But it basically, how are you progressing? What feedback have you got? Any challenges we need to know about? Um, anything we need to change in your goals or your KPIs, key performance indicators? any other professional development that you know needs to happen or hasn't happened any anything else you know do you need some annual leave how you going general well-being check-in yes so, i was actually going to ask you that about the fact that that when you've got those main main meetings in place then you're doing that monthly check-in <clears throat> what that i i'm assuming i'm, I'm assuming here that in i generalizing over time that would make people feel comfortable to share i've actually had some family crisis i've actually had this happen um, that's why, you know, it's been a bit up and down or, you know, you're doing really well because everyone's supported at home. Whatever it is, that sharing of information um, then becomes quite easy when it's not something that's just, oh, let's just sit and talk about something now. You're absolutely spot on. And one of the things I talked about before about building that trust and that relationship, Yes. often we find that um, particularly in early years, because I, I obviously work in a few different other sectors, but mainly early years, Teachers, are they find it quite hard to make an appointment with their manager or the person they report to to talk about something that they think might not be very important, like, oh, something's happened at home or yes, I've got a problem with um, another colleague, how we're both deciding how we're going to work with a particular family. And they think that, oh, maybe I need to work it out myself or it's not important enough to make it a time for it. Yes. So I think that... When you know, though, I have got a scheduled time to talk about something, those things are more easily talked about before they become bigger things. Yes. Um, and, and also the other tip I would give is scheduling in all the meetings a year 
in advance and they're in everybody's calendar. Now, we all know that occasionally meetings won't go ahead because there's a crisis happening or something a lot more important that has to be dealt with because it's an incident, an incident or something else that's quite yeah. important. But at least you're not missing, at least you can, rescheduling one meeting or moving something is, is a lot easier than trying to, to schedule in all this time while other, th other the business and, as usual is happening. Yes, and what you're talking about there is some of those challenges. And obviously it isn't always unicorns and rainbows. Um, what are some of the challenges um, that you could share with us? The biggest challenge would be time. Yes. And finding the, bringing everyone together to realise this will be better for the, the organisation as a whole and the benefits of it and how if it's done well, it's, it's the success of it. And I think at the start, it's bringing people along to allow that time. Now, in, in realistic terms, sometimes budgets don't allow for the amount of meetings that I might be suggesting. Yes. But you can start small and then hopefully as people are seeing the success of it and it's actually less time in the long run because you've been able to deal with situations quicker and deal with someone's giving feedback backwards and forwards, employer and employee, things haven't then become a bigger issue where it's taken up more time of management and more time of staff and or in worst case scenario has led to some great big workplace investigation. <laughs> yes. And everyone's been interviewed and it's, it's, it becomes a whole big hours and hours. So it, it, the time would be the biggest challenge is factoring in the time. So I would say factor in the three meetings a year to start with and doing some pre-work, so having, you know, making the meeting shorter, whereas people can do the, some of the preparation in their own time. Um, and then as you sort of get into the flow of it, having maybe the regular check-ins. If you're from a health, uh, if, if anyone's, any of the listeners are from the health area, they'd be quite used to having what they call supervision, and that usually is done every couple of weeks. So there is... Even in other industries, they do have those check-ins and debriefs quite regularly. So it's not impossible. It's just a matter of how you prioritise the time. And I understand it's not always uh, possible to get it the time. Absolutely, absolutely. And I suppose the the there's the fear of, um, you know, like I may not have the time to deal with what comes out of it to start with as well, rather than it's not just going to be that unicorn and rainbow conversation. It might be a bit tougher. And knowing that, you know, oh, God, it's going to cause me more work. That Would you see a lot of that as well? Yeah, so what we say is don't set 17 goals. Don't give people 18 KPIs. <laughs> you know, maybe let's start with two or three for the year. <laughs> yes. Um, and so it's about... Your expectation as an employer, as a manager or team leader, working with your staff to make it as easy and simple to transition into this where they hopefully will see the benefits. Um, but make, being consistent, I have to really emphasise that. So you can't have one staff member with 20 goals and somebody else with one. So it has to be, you know, what we recommend is up to six for everyone. And you can have a combination of goals and KPIs Yes, and you can have a combination, and that that's okay. How that combination works, but no more than six. So someone might have four, and someone might have five. That's okay, but it yeah. really have to be fair and consistent in how absolutely approached. Yeah, yeah, and you can't just make it about the person who's doing the better end of the job. So therefore, they can meet more. It's about actually that, like I said, the consistency, and um, and also not only that for for the leader or the person reviewing it, they've only got six up to six to review, not up to 18 to review, because even that's time-consuming to, like, keep on track of everyone's um, goals and objectives. Yes, yeah, so it's, that's exactly right. So, again, we recommend that that shared uh, leadership approach where, uh, and actually a lot of our clients will say we love it because we don't, we don't think that the director knows what we do day to day. They're not in our room. So we prefer that the room leader is actually working with us on our goals or our KPIs or whatever. Yeah. They know what we do every day. And I will answer this question because it does come up 
nearly every single time, and that is, what if I'm in an ed- an educator and I work with across two rooms? Because a lot of we have a lot of part timers that work in they work yes. two rooms in a centre, maybe three. And I get this every single time. Um, who do they then report to? Who do they do their performance evaluation or development plan with? And the way we answer that is if there's somebody they work more with, then you make them the lead more hours with and then they consult with the other room leader so there's there's input into that. If it's equal, no, well, I work, you know, three hours in each room. What do I do then? What we then say is for one performance period for 12 months, the lead might be Paula. Yes. 12-month period, we swap it over to Kathy, who's the other room leader. But Paula and Kathy have to really consult about that person's uh, goals and discussions and how they've been going in each room and where maybe they need some extra support. And that's where we might bring our educational leader in and say, well, um, you know, educational leader, we, you know, this particular person that we've been talking about, it may be a graduate and you need some help with documentation. Yes, um, yes. Can you please mentor them, help them a little bit more, coach them around documenting um, that they might need that for the next 12 months. So we, everything sort of, should, sort of links together. The same with the professional development. A, a lot of times we, we want to go and do professional learning on things that we like, which is okay as well. But it's also good to link our professional learning to the goals or KPIs that we're trying to improve, the areas we're trying to improve. So if you're not across the the, the NQS and you're new to the sector, maybe there's some training about that that you can um, attend. And and in this instance, I'm not talking about the mandatory training that everybody does, first aid, anaphylaxis and those child safe standards and all those things. Your personal professional development or performance plan and should actually be things that are related to your own development and aspirations and career goals and things like that. And and this is where, of course, for centres having that approach that's that leadership team, what they then set up is that um, hierarchy to a degree where you've got a, um, a development or a career trail. So someone may want to be um, a leader, so the next level up, or the next or centre manager aspirations, where they can then have in their objectives that um, leadership or management training. And someone else may not want to do that. They might want to be the outdoor um, coordinator, so they have different focus. Yeah, that's exactly right. So it's very per- it can be personalised for them, and and also as I said, it can also be linked to the strategic plan of that organisation yeah. or service as well. Yeah. Now, can I ask you, Kathy? We've got a wonderful group of people listening from um, graduates right through to owners, providers who aren't necessarily doing it with best practice or they, they'd like to um, look at doing something better. Now, they don't have anything. What um, what would you suggest they do? Because obviously there'd be like some templates someone could follow or there'd be some practical advice, um, even contacting obviously you at Ideas to Outcomes is there um, anything that you could say to them? Look, make sure you've got we've got this information right. So there's a in in Victoria, there's a resource that uh, I led in the development years ago, and then there's and also supported its update a few years ago, and it's on the Ella website. Yes. It's called Employee Management and Development Resource. It's got a big resource. It covers the employee um, relationship from pretty much um, orientate, you know, once you've recruited them, not recruitment, but orientation. It's got lists in there for orientation, probation period. But it also has this process that I'm talking about and it has forms in Word format. Oh, easy. (laughs) So it is a free downloadable resource. So I would suggest to listeners to not be overwhelmed when they first look at it. There is a, we've developed what's called a quick reference guide. So you can uh, click on that and download that first just to see roughly what's in the resource and what the process is. There's also some free modules and training as well that you can download on that website that talk about the sort of process and things I've been talking about. Now that resource has been developed specifically for early years. Right. And, and so that was on the Ella website? On the Ella website called yes. Employer, Employee Management and Development Resource. 
Right. And Fantastic. Whole, Thank you um, for sharing that. And there's a whole bank of, because um, we like things to not be, um, we don't want to re, and I know one of your other uh, uh, presenters was saying this, we don't want to rewrite things when we've got things there. We just want to update and change it and tailor it to suit us. And yes. one of the things we've got there is a whole bank of key performance indicators under each quality area. So you can either use them as they are, you can change some of the wording. So there's already, so, yeah, so that's a fabulous resource for, that was funded by the Department of Education here in Victoria. So it is a fabulous resource to look at. Which is fantastic because that's quite often, um, I know even for me, the stumbling block is, oh, I just want to have a template. I just want to get this right so it's consistent. Where do I look? Yeah, that's a good, really good starting point is there. And just re reminding everyone, you don't have to do everything that's there. So yes. you can actually just start small and have a, a meeting with your leadership team and see what will work for your culture and your staff and, like, who will lead the process, who will report to who on this. Are you going to use goals? Are you going to use KPIs? Will you use a combination? What time of the year are you going to meet? So you can, you know, uh, uh, have you got enough in your budget to ad allow adequate time for the meetings that we're talking about? Yes, yes. And and often, um, you know, once they've got that right, it is that next step of like, let's put it all in. And um, you can see where it could also be a bit of a challenge for staff thinking, oh, my God, we've done something wrong um, in those first set of meetings. So it's overcoming those fears as well. So it's really getting everyone to look at the um, the process as well as yes. this is going to work for us. And, again, making it clear that it, this is not about underperformance. That's a whole different process. This is really about developing and being positive, yeah, with the employee. And having that. Wow. And what we'll do, um, Cathy, is we will share information about ideas for outcomes as part of this as well. And um, we might be able to even find that resource that you mentioned and share that as well. Um, now, looking forward, what are or what is the biggest challenge for the sector that you consider in the next sort of two to five years? I don't, I don't have a very big solution for it at this stage. And I know lots and lots of people are working on it, but I think it would have to be staff, the staff shortages. We've got a lot, obviously, hours are increasing for, uh, particularly here in Victoria where I'm based, um, increasing hours for three-year-old and four-year-old. We've got the pre-prep four-year-old hours increasing lots of new schools with um, early year services being built or going to be built. Um, I know by talking to colleagues around Australia, they've also got the same issues with um, attracting, retaining quality staff. So yes. regional, I have a lot of regional rural clients, um, even harder for them. So Absolutely. I think that's probably... It's been amazing that we've had all the funding and the the, the emphasis and highlighting how important the early years are and having such a focus on this, which has been amazing, been a lot of advocacy by amazing, inspirational people for years now. I think that probably how we're going to staff it, and I know that there are some organisations working towards that, but I think that's going to be a little bit tricky uh, in the meantime, I know some. I'm on a board for um, for we have uh, it's, we have school. We work with um, basically our kindergartens are based or work closely with schools. That's yes. the model. And one of the things that we're trying to do is look at okay, who's in the community? Who are some of the parents that might have shown an interest that we that maybe are interested in doing some a diploma or. You know, so it might be looking into the community that you are operating to see if there's people within that community that you, that you could support to do some um, education. Yeah, and that's and that's um, really important what you've just said there because it's might even be someone um, a mum who's got some time on her hands in the day and trying to find work around children that even might be at the preschool. That's correct, and they might want to. Change of career as well. Yes, so, uh, absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah, I think to answer your question, probably if you were to say what keeps you awake at night, I'd have to say I'm concerned about having enough staff in the sector. Yeah, I, I I hear you, and I think all our audience are certainly across that as well. And you know, it's just going to be time. Um, and and, and we're working on um, creative 
ways and there's you know more training and I know the governments are trying really hard to put in some incentives for yes for that yeah and and pay increases and things like that as well so it's yeah look at some um, it's certainly something that um has been a common message every time I've asked that question it's usually the the number one <laughs> at the moment yeah. hopefully it changes and we get you know we get through this um through this challenge now before we finish up we love to ask our wonderful guests for a personal motto or a wise word do you have one that you'd like to share with our listeners so I've got about three but I'll share one today that I think is probably fitting I think it's it's about the leadership ripple effect. And it, in summary is that all our actions and decisions that we take every day have a ripple effect. Yes. So our friends, our colleagues, um, observers, it could be a parent or a family member that's observing us, how we're treating another child or another family. As an approved provider or an employer, it could be other staff observing how we are yeah. treating an other employee. Maybe they've got an illness. Maybe something challenging has happened. They're observing. So everything we do, we say, has a ripple effect around us. And a lot of people may be thinking it's they're just talking to one person in that moment, but it's actually that decision or action. Even the simple act of smiling or not smiling when you walk past somebody will have a ripple effect to, to their day or your or others that have observed that interaction. So probably that would be what I'd leave you with is that um yeah the 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 person is Amy Franco it's it's, it's a she has a more detailed quote about it but yeah it's basically all our actions I think yeah have a and decisions have a ripple effect just to remember that oh, as working. Look, and that would be great if you wouldn't mind sharing that with us as well and then we can put that out with our audience um through our socials and of course we'll share all all your information as well Kathy and look and thank you so much for being with us today i appreciate your time and um and look forward to our next one thank you so much for having me i really appreciate it and i know that you've got some great listeners and and clients as well that um that you've been interviewing so thank you paul yes. it's a great thing you're doing thank you so much kathy appreciate it thanks okay. bye